Hello, and welcome to Critical Connections Live. I'm Tim Buckman, Editor-in-Chief of the journal Critical Care Medicine, and my guest today is Dr. Omar Badawi of Philips Healthcare. Dr. Badawi will be presenting a path-breaking paper in the late-breaking session, finding a new predictor of patient outcome whose performance exceeds that of traditional SOFA scoring and even Apache 4. Dr. Badawi, welcome. Thanks for having me. It's a privilege to have you here. Will you tell us a little bit about yourself and your role at Philips Healthcare? Thanks. So my original background is as a critical care pharmacist, uh, and I also expanded on that with a background in public health with epidemiology and biostatistics. And I've been working in research and product development under uh, Philips Healthcare with EICU programs for over a dozen years now. Congratulations. I know that the EICU program, which is the premier tele-ICU program in the world, has as part of its effort accumulation of a very large data set. Will you tell Critical Connections Live and the audience a little bit about the dimensions of that data set, how many years it's been collected, how many patients have been entered, how many data elements there are? Yeah, that's a good question. So really the EIC Research Institute is leveraging the EICU program data, which has been around for over 15 years. And with every EICU implementation, there are standardized interfaces bringing in all the vital signs, medications, laboratory data, all as it happens in the ICU space. Uh, vital signs are archived every five minutes and brought into this database. And so what we have over that 15 years is hundreds of hospitals, over four million ICU patients in there, and literally billions of vital sign data points and lab values that we can analyze and look at a very granular level what's happening across the ICU stay. So this is a much deeper database than the conventional electronic medical record because you've accumulated vital signs as frequently as every five minutes, That's not right. requiring editing or validation, but the raw data as they come in. That's correct. Terrific. One of the features of the tele-ICU system, the EICU system, was the creation of the discharge readiness score. Can you tell us a little bit about how that score was conceived and what it was intended to do, and then go on and tell us a little bit about how it differs from other commonly encountered scores in critical care, such as the SOFA score and Apache. Right. Yeah, so actually the discharge readiness score was one of the first uh, major research endeavors we did with the EIC Research Institute. So when we collaborated with uh, EICU programs through academics and uh, hospitals, we looked at how could we tap into this data to build new tools that would support the ICU practice. So you wanted to build new tools that would support the ICU practice. How would a discharge readiness score support the clinician at the bedside, the physician or the nurse, trying to make a decision about how to manage their ICU? Right, so one of the ideas is that there's, there's always the possibility that there are patients in the ICU today that don't need to be there, that maybe they're not as um, in need of those critical beds that uh, other patients may need. And there's also the flip side of the equation, which are there are patients who might not quite be ready to go, yet they might get moved out prematurely and end up with consequences down the line like readmission or potentially uh, dying within uh, hours or days after discharge if they weren't quite ready to go to a lower acuity floor. So the idea of the discharge readiness score was to provide an image of the patient, both in terms of the physiologic derangement as well as the amount of treatment that was being applied. For example, whether the patient was on a simple oxygen mask or actually requiring a mechanical ventilator or anything in between. Is that correct? Yes, it is, yeah. So we, we tried to look into the data. We explored all the different features we could to see what would be most predictive um, and use the data in a slightly different way than what you see in some of the traditional models. And because we have such granular data and insight minute to minute what's going on, we were able to introduce new variables such as 
uh, coefficient of variation and moving averages that we could put into the score that would uh, prove to be highly predictive of the outcomes. So that's really important. Our patients aren't stable. They're dynamic. Our treatments aren't constant. They too are dynamic. And by getting some sense of the dynamism, both of the patient and of the treatment, you gain further insight into the stability or instability and the trajectory that that patient will eventually follow. Now, that's more complicated, of course, than traditional scores, starting with the therapeutic intervention score many years ago. It's also a bit more complicated than the SOFA score. How does it compare in terms of the number of variables that go into the discharge readiness score, comparing it with a contemporary high-resolution risk stratifier, such as Apache 4? So overall, it's, it's fairly similar in terms of the quantity of data. Uh, most of it is, is labs and physiology. Where you see a lot of the extra variables come in are looking at data in different ways. So we could look at heart rate, look at the average heart rate, but we could also look at the variability uh, and, and so forth. So you might see um, what looks like multiple variables, but at the end of the day, it really is not much more complex than what you see from the other models in terms of data inputs. Can you tell us what motivated you and your colleagues at Philips Healthcare to use the discharge readiness score, a score that combines both patient physiology, caregiver treatment, and time series analysis to use this in a new and different way? Yeah, thanks. So one of, the, uh, one of the issues with putting out discharge readiness score and using it in system was it was originally designed for estimating the risk of dying within 48 hours of ICU discharge. And so by necessity, when we developed that model, we only used ICU survivors in the patient cohort. And uh, really, so these were extremely stable patients on their way out of the ICU without care limitations. So the question really arose, what would this model look like and how would it be interpreted earlier in the ICU stay? Someone's getting actively resuscitated, they're just admitted to the ICU. How do you interpret a score that was never even uh, designed to look at patients who were that unstable? So you move the score earlier into the course of the patient's stay and you ask yourself, how well did this score risk stratify your patients compared with the current benchmarks, such as SOFA and Apache 4. How many patients did you have available for this comparison? All right, in this study we had a little over 560,000 ICU patients we were able to analyze. 560,000 ICU patients taken over a period, how long? Are these old or are these recent patients? No, these were fairly recent, between 2013 and 16. So this is recent patients, contemporary ICU care, and a database of 560,000 patients. Can you summarize for our listeners what you found when you compared the performance of the discharge readiness score with these other two contemporary standard risk stratifiers? Right, on a, on a high level, all three of the risk scores had pretty decent um, and good discrimination for ICU mortality and 24-hour mortality. Uh, but what we saw was Apache had a consistently higher AUC than SOFA, and DRS had a consistently higher AUC than both Apache and SOFA. And that persisted through quite a few uh, sensitivity analyses, whether it was diagnostic groups or uh, among the hundreds of hospitals we used in the database. So when you talk about AUC, you're talking about the area under the receiver operator curve, a classic method of a, comparing the performance of one classifier with another. Correct. Now, death has become a relatively rare event in the ICU population. What was the uh, mortality of this cohort of 560,000 plus patients? Overall, ICU mortality was just under 5%, and overall hospital mortality was just over 8%. One of the best ways to look at classifier performance when events are rare is to examine the precision recall curve. Did you do that as part of your study? Yes, we actually did, and, and we added it into the online uh, interactive supplement that's available for readers to use as well. 
Um, and, and you can evaluate all the algorithms and look at different subgroups and see how those curves change and what the performance looks like. Now, Dr. Badawi has just revealed one of the big secrets of critical care medicine. Later in this meeting, we are going to announce the availability of an online tool that will allow any reader to become a user to explore that data set of 560,000 patients to decide how well the discharge readiness score will perform looking at the patients similar to the ones that you see in your ICU in your hospital every day. It's another effort of critical care medicine to allow you to deliver the right care right now. Dr. Badawi, it's been a privilege to have you here with us today on Critical Connections Live. I'm Tim Buckman, editor of the journal Critical Care Medicine. Thanks for being with us.